Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's DVT Insight session. We've just started the session, so we're just going to give folks a moment to join into our call today. Um, glad to have you all with us. And we are very excited to have Stefan with us as well. And we'll give folks another 30 seconds and then we'll get going. There we go. I see Stefan is making sure that he's hydrated, ready for his session. Exactly. <laughs> it's a trying thing, these DVT inside sessions, Stefan. <laughs> All right, I think that's right on time for us. We've given folks some time to join us. And again, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining our DVT Insights session today. We have Stefan Swart with us on a topic that I'm sure is probably near and dear to your heart, DevOps or die, but extreme. But Stefan is going to tell you exactly why that is so critical to your software journey. Stefan joins us as a CTO across a number of organizations, as well as having a very strong history in development and DevOps implementation and leadership. So we have an expert in our midst to share with you what you really need to understand about DevOps today. Stefan, thank you so much for joining us today. We, we've had the privilege of you being on our calls before. It's been great session talking about the Finch app in terms of what you've done there. And I'm sure everybody's looking forward to hearing what you have to say today. Just for our audience, there are a couple of interaction points here in terms of the session with Stefan. When you are either asked a question or you have a question, please use the Q&A function that is part of the team session today. Log your question there or log your answer there, and that will be the basis for us picking up on those and then sharing that back to Stefan during the course of the talk today. Session will be about 40 minutes, round about there, and at the end we will also have a Q&A session, time permitting, and we will take your questions again through that Q&A function. And with that, I'll hand over to Stefan. Stefan, thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Thanks for having me, and uh, thank you for your kind words. And um, let me just. All right. So, welcome, everyone. And uh, again, well, thank you for having me at the DVT Insights. It's always a pleasure to, to share thoughts with, with you all. So, DevOps or die? And um, Carl already introduced me, so I'm going to skip this part. Um, but you can, what you can know is that. I do come from the trenches and I know the pain of not having DevOps and the opposite of actually having DevOps and the difference that it makes. So the agenda for my talk is the fact, we will start with the fact that Agile is dead and we will look at whether it can be revived. And then we'll look at the history of DevOps and the promise of DevOps. What, what, what is it that DevOps promises us? And then finally, and most importantly, what is the role that you can play? Okay. So as a start, let's see if that Q&A button works. Um, please tell me, in your opinion, what is DevOps? So if you can just head down to the Q&A section on Teams and type there, what is DevOps? give a word or a phrase. I'll give a few six seconds for that. So the question is, what is DevOps? Uh, I see some answers. Automation. Yeah. Collaboration. DevOps is management. Well, that's inter that's an interesting point. Great. Okay, as the as the as it, please keep on bringing removing accidental complexity as much as possible so devs can focus on essential problems. That's it. I love that definition. 
development and co operations collaborating. Great stuff. Now, feel free to add your, your answers even as I continue. So, DevOps will die, Agile is dead, keeping with the death theme here. <laughs> I'm of the opinion that Agile is dead. Unless you also include DevOps. So Agile without DevOps is dead. Why do I say this? Well, if you look at a, a, a very familiar Agile framework called Scrum, and others are quite the same, where, where we have a big focus on the software team, you will see that the, the, the main focus here is on where the, from the moment that the work hits the team, and what the team do, then does with that to the point where they pr produce this increment. Now, unfortunately, what I've seen a lot in our industry is that this increment does not seem to immediately go to the users. Instead, this happens. So we build all these increments, and then we have this massive batch of work that we want to deploy, and we end up with deployments looking a lot like this. And this is quite unfortunate and unnecessary. So we don't want deployments looking like this. I'm sure most of you that's been in the software industry for more than two years have been through pain of doing a deployment like this and worst case scenario doing a deployment like this on a friday evening and then having to sit through the weekend fixing all the issues so what we want to get to is get rid of the, these massive batches and instead get the value in front of the users as soon as possible now <clears throat> the people that have done the most research and I would say, like, are the most well backed by the research they've done are the people that wrote this book. These people, um, Nicole Forsgren, Jess Humble, and Jean Kim, were key in creating the um, annual DevOps report. So they were the first people doing that, and but the, the report has also continued since um, they they they're not involved anymore. But this book is accumulation of quite a few years of the research that they did. And what they found is quite significant. They found that using DevOps practices, and we'll go get into what these are quite soon, but using DevOps practices can significantly improve software delivery performance and organization performance as a whole. So what they bundle as DevOps in, in this book is this. So <clears throat> this comes directly from their book. And what, what it shows is, as I said, that the DevOps practices all lead to software del delivery performance and organizational performance. So where does Agile fit in? Well, that's, and, and that's uh, what I loved about one of the, the, the comments on what is DevOps. It is management. Yes, it is management as well. So it's working with Agile principles and Lean principles in our day-to-day, -day, in our software delivery teams. Then it's also using continuous delivery practices of test automation, deployment automation. So there were some, some of you that said automation, uh, version control, monitoring, proactive notifications. Very important one I see in MC Backer in the, in the audience as well, shifting left on security. And then there's also transformational leadership. And um, now I'm, Personally, quite passionate about leadership. I, I, my, my niche is working with tech leaders and, and helping them become better leaders and creating high-performing teams and organizations. 
And this is something that, that's so often missed when thinking about DevOps. It, it feels like we're thinking about gears and automation, but we, we so often forget about the people part. So the history of DevOps, a, a short story on where this DevOps thing came from and, and where we got the name. This started in 2007. Patrick de Boa was a, a consultant, still is, and within software and, and IT. And he had a very interesting career objective. Patrick wanted to be a, a consultant that had the widest range of experience in different roles within IT and, and software. So every time he got an op the opportunity, he would take on a different role. And this led him to be the head of a, a QA um, team within a, a project in Belgium where they did a massive migration, a data migration between uh, a, a, a bank's legacy system and their new system. And in this project, he became really frustrated because he saw that there was this massive gap in communication between the developers that were working and, and the operations teams. And then talking to others in the industry, he realized like this is a massive industry crisis. And he wanted to do something about that. So in 2008, he submitted a talk called Agile Infrastructure for the conference, the, the Agile conference in Toronto. He got very bad feedback on this talk title <laughs> and so bad that he himself decided not to show up for his own talk because he knew no one else will show up. But someone did other than him. And this guy was Andrew Clay Schiffer. So Andrew was quite distraught that uh, Patrick wasn't there. So he went looking for him in, in the halls and he found him. And then he said, no, we can't just leave this at, at, at this point. We have to do something about this issue. And they started a Google group called Agile System Administration. This Google group didn't really get a lot of traction. And then the next year, in 2009, there was a conference, the Velocity Conference, O'Reilly's Velocity Conference. And at this conference, two people from, from Flickr, which is a, an image sharing platform, John Alspor and Paul Hammond, did a talk called 10 plus deploys per day, the, the dev and ops operation, co-operation at Flickr. And Patrick was looking at this, um, he, he joined the conference um, online and he was so frustrated that he wa he couldn't be at the conference in in person so he he lamented on uh, on twitter and then a friend of his paul nazrat said well why, why don't you start your own conference and that's exactly what he did so then in 2009 the same year <laughs> he, he moved quickly in october he started a, a conference it was um, uh, uh, well, th they wanted the name for this conference and they wondered no, what would they call it. We want developers there. We want operations people there. And it will be two days of conferencing. So let's call it DevOps Days. But then for the conference itself, they didn't want to use DevOps Days for the Twitter has hashtag. It, they, they said it's just too long. So they um, reverted to just using DevOps. And the hashtag stuck. They got rid of this Agile system administration, big words. And that's why it's called DevOps today. And that's how it was popularized. Now, the year after that, some of the people that were at the first conference said, like, we want to take this to our homes, our, our cities. And they continued with that in Sydney and Mountain View. And today, DevOps Days is hosted worldwide. 
Um, I, I actually recently saw that there is uh, there are plans to host a DevOps days in Johannesburg. Just before COVID, there were quite a few DevOps days in Cape Town. But since then, we, we haven't had one in South Africa. So after the, the conferences started, the tool shops saw a gap and we saw a new tool revolution. And it became really cool to get involved in this tool, in, in this DevOps thing, because you could use these new tools. In 2011, something significant also happened. This is where the, the analysts became involved and they started saying that this movement you can either you can ignore at your own peril. Um, and they predicted that by 2015, so this was back in 2011, by 2015, DevOps will evolve from a niche strategy employed by large cloud providers into a mainstream strategy employed by 20% of global 2000 organizations. This proved to be wrong. It grew actually much quicker than that. So from 2011 to 2013, we saw a lot of early adopters uh, on the DevOps train. The two, tool chain exploded in 2014 to 2016. I mean, even today, we still see that explosion continuing with uh, Kubernetes and all the tools around that. 2017 to, to 19, we saw um, the scaling and, and especially the cloud providers pushing DevOps practices really hard. And around about 2020, or even a bit before that, uh, the, the security people said, listen, we see too much of DevOps happening without security, although like, security is part of the DevOps practices. But we then decided to add the security into the DevOps, and this, that's why we have DevSecOps. And, and then also GitOps started to be a thing. And GitOps is basically where we take the best practices of DevOps um, for software delivery, and we use that for our infrastructure as code as well. So we use version control, pull requests, um, etc., for for our infrastructure as well. And then finally, we can also see currently AI is a thing. <laughs> and we see a lot of AI and machine learning integrations in our pipelines. And, um, uh, and then also there's a big focus on developer experience. So uh, this is also quite a, a new-ish, but, but a big movement around developer experience and making things as, as smooth as possible for the developers. Like one of you mentioned in the, in the um, Q&A, that um, it's taking out, it's taking away all the peripheral stuff so that the developers can focus on, on solving the real problems. Okay, so I would like to hear, if we get out of the way, questions. What has this DevOps history sparked in you? So I want you to just take a minute and Right in the the Q and A or the chat, but preferably the Q and A, and um, tell us what has this history sparked in you? Is there something that you didn't know, um, or that you think you would like to take forward? Something that's uh, that was significant for me when I when I uh, heard this or, or read about this history is that it's a movement that didn't start with a product. It's a movement that started with the frustration of a consultant and other people seeing that that frustration in in their worlds as well. So it's really a grassroots movement. 
So thank you. MCA says that change is super quick and constant, evolving all the time. You can almost never stay ahead. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so what's the promise of DevOps? Like, why should we care? In the state of DevOps report, we see that the promise of DevOps is quite significant. It's really something that we can't ignore. Um, and that's why I said DevOps or die. If we look at the highest performers, so these are the people or the organizations that really perform well and, and are quite mature in their practices of DevOps <clears throat> versus the lower performers. We can see that these higher performers spend 50% less time fixing security issues. And they, they also spend 22% less time on unplanned work and rework. Now, there's a return on investment immediately, right? If you can just, just take that, if you can measure your unplanned work and rework and you reduce that by 22%, it's, it's a massively significant. It can't be ignored. They also found that high performers deploy 200 times more frequent than the low performers. The next stat is quite like mind boggling because it's not 2.555, it's 2,555 times shorter lead time. So the, this lead time uh, for changes, what, it, what, what we're measuring there is the time it takes your team or organization to take code from the moment that the developers are done with it. So they checked it into um, Git onto, up to the moment where that code lives in front of a user. Okay, so that's your lead time, going through all the different environments, being tested with everything you want to test it and doing all your deploys. 2,555 times shorter lead times. That's massively significant. They've got three times lower change failure rates. So change failure rate is how often do we deploy and we leave our users in a worse so it's worst case, and 24 times faster recovery from failures. And that's, yeah, that's amazing. That's really amazing. So what's also significant is that DevOps promises that we can have efficiency, quality, and speed. We don't, it's not a trade-off be between the three. We can increase our delivery rate while reducing waste and minimize defects in products delivered to the customer and bring products to the market in shorter time. So why does this matter to you? It really, like, it really doesn't matter what role you play. If you are involved in software delivery all the way from getting the idea in up to the point of maintaining and, and monitoring, you can play a role in improving the DevOps practices of your organization and thereby also improving these things and improving these things. So how do we know whether we're winning at it and how can we contribute? Well, if you help your team improve these metrics, so these metrics, it's not Stefan's thumbsuck metrics. It is. It also comes from the research by Nicole Forsgren and her team, and <clears throat> was published in the State of DevOps report as well as uh, the Accelerate book. These metrics are the the speed metrics of lead time for changes, which I just explained. The time between code is, is done until the point where it's in production in front of the users. Deployment frequency, how often do you deploy? And then the quality metrics of change failure rate, how often do we deploy, leave and leave our customers and or the, uh, the users in a worse state than, than they, it was before. And time to restore service is when something goes wrong in production, how long does it take us to get that back up and running? 
and working. Okay, so you, we see the availability is there as well. Availability, however, in this is, is more like a, it will happen if we get the others right. So it doesn't have to be the focus. If we focus on, on the other metrics, availability will get better. What's fascinating as well about the research is that they found that if you only focus on speed, your quality will improve as well. So if you focus on these two green ones, if you improve your lead time for changes and your deployment frequency, you will as well improve your change failure rate and your time to restore service. So what you can also do, doesn't matter what role you have or what you shouldn't do, is you shouldn't work in silos. Now, this is something that I'm sure most of you have, have um, understand already, but it's sometimes we also forget that we should in who we should include. So we have cross-functional teams from business analysts, testers, developers, but what about operations? What about security? Do we keep them in silos or do we include them in our conversations about what we are planning to build so that they can give their insights early in the process and be involved in the, in, um, during the whole process? Also, something that you should not do as a member of one of these teams is don't push, but rather pull. So what do I mean by this? So let me just get my slide. Okay, so to illustrate a push system versus a pull system, a push system, we have a, let's say, a product owner over here. Product owner refines the stories and then start pushing them into the next um, phase of development, whichever that is, but probably analysis. And then as these people get done, they push these stories over to develop. And then as these people get done, they push the stories over to testing. And what typically happens is you get bottlenecks very easily within this process. And then if testing uh, is happy, which they normally aren't the first time, but when they're, they're happy, they say, okay, this is ready for production. And you can see that here we are building one of those uh, trucks that we just saw, those Africa trucks that's overloaded. And then the poor people that need to do the deployment get quite a few surprises um, with, with all the things that they need to take to production. Okay, so that's what a push system looks like. Okay, so we're pushing, once I'm done with my stuff, I push it to the next phase, and then I it's not my problem anymore. What a pull system looks like, if we, if we work, if if we do pool system end to end, this is what it looks like. Once I'm done with my story, I put it into the next the next phase. But then instead of taking something from the backlog and starting to work on that, what I do instead is because we are cross functional and all working together. I go and see is there anything that blocking this story from going into production that I can help with, whether I'm a business analyst or a tester or a developer, doesn't matter. If there is something, then I do that. And maybe by just clarifying someone's question, I can actually help get this into production. But let's say I can't do that at all. What I can do is I can then go to the testers and say, what are you testing at the moment? And could there be something that I can help explain because I did the analysis maybe for that story? Or maybe I did the developments and, and, and I know how, how I tested it. Then I sit with them and I help them get this story into the next phase. Let's say there's really nothing for me to do here. 
then I go to the development and I, I ask them, is there something I can help with? Maybe just sitting in, um, in one of their se development sessions, clarifying some of the, the, the words that they need, need to use. Um, yeah. But whatever I do, I can help them get this into ready for test quicker. Maybe there's really nothing for me to do there. Is there anything I can help my fellow analyst with? If there's nothing, maybe I can help my product owner or I can take one of these stories again. So the focus is not just am I getting my, the stuff done in front of myself, but rather am I helping the team as a whole get things into production, get value in front of the user, because it, in the end, that's all that counts. So it's really taking an end-to-end -end responsibility as a team. Yeah. So it looks like, yeah. Um, so that's, that's my talk. Um, uh, feel free to add some questions in the Q and A, and just on an, on, a, on another point, if you want more information about DevOps and uh, what you can do and why it matters to you and how it works, we are are launching a DevOps Foundation training with DBT. Um, it's already on their website, and or you can scan that QR code right there and it will take you to the page and then on another point i'm also as i said i'm passionate about tech leadership if you are a tech leader and you want to get involved in a in a focused group with other tech leaders and share experiences and, and learn together feel free to reach out to me and that's my email address right there so are there any questions great stuff stefan so Stefan, just quickly on behalf of the audience, I'd say thank you very much for that presentation. Most informative. To our audience, please do use the Q&A function to raise your questions there. I will take a look at those and share those with Stefan. If he otherwise is multitasking, he may do the same. In the interim, Stefan, I'm going to throw in a question of my own. Mm. I guess just going back to your, your last slide and the explanation of push and pull in terms of that, I, I would guess that a fundamental of this is changing people's behavior and focus from their their own personal here's my list of things i've got to get done to a team orientation going we have shared metrics that represent the flow through the entire process that we're now responsible for does that tie back to those initial metrics that you were talking about in terms of the the time to change or the the change failure rate etc Yes, definitely, most definitely. Yeah, so so those those metrics are metrics that you can share as a team. Um, I do have <clears throat> an, another uh, another talk on on developer productivity, um, and these metrics I would say like is is essential because they can't be gamed, right? So so it's normally in organizational behavior, uh, it's difficult to use metrics because once. Uh, once you aim for something, it starts to be, it stops being a good metric. But those metrics have been tried and tested, and you can really um, trust them. And you, you also ask a very important question because uh, your question, uh, your comment on changing people's behavior. If an organization is um, focusing on individual contribution, you won't see. A proper pool system, right? You won't see an end-to-end -end people taking end-to-end -end responsibility. So there's a big aspect of how we incentivize and how we build our processes, and are those supportive of this kind of behavior that that makes the team as a whole win? Um, and it's 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 not easy, I know, <laughs> um, but but it's it's super important. It's not something that we can turn a blind eye to um, if, if I know that you are going like my boss is going to measure me on, on how many stories I'm pushing right I'm going to push <laughs> I'm not going to 
talk to other people and see if I can help them. Yeah. So Stefan, in, in your consulting to organizations, what have you found have been the things that you've either demonstrated or shown or, or given them an exposure to that has really turned on the lights in terms of this is how it works, this is where the value comes from? Um, I'm not sure if I'm completely answering your question. Now, help me if I'm if I'm not. But uh, a big thing that I that I coach teams with is not assigning work to individuals. Um, you know, so that's on a team level something you can do. Also, understanding that what like software de development is problem solving, and if we think about just what like how do we best problem solve? We tend to best problem solve when we work together, when we sit and brainstorm something and, um, you know, especially complex problems like software that software normally um, addresses. So the coding part is a very small part of actually building software. And therefore practices like pair programming or ensemble programming which for some people is like, how can two people do one person's job? If you are problem solving, you are actually working together to better solve that problem and, and getting um, quality out. And the savings on that is, is also tremendous. You're also addressing other, other challenges like uh, key man dependencies, right? So in a push system, you will have key man dependencies. On a pull system, you're addressing that risk for for an organization of of not having key man dependencies, which is uh, tremendous. Yeah. Am I answering okay. your question, Carl? You are, Stefan, and I, and I guess associated with that is, I I would think that a lot of people think of DevOps and DevSecOps and nowadays ML Ops almost as a a methodology to go, you implement the methodology and, and there you go. You're now <laughs> fantastic and wonderful and you'll get all the success that you're looking for. But I expect that that culture and skill and capability within a particular team and combination of resources is actually a fundamental factor that will influence that whole implementation and the success of the implementation. For sure, yeah. And, and organize... One of the, the things that I think is, is very underestimated is organizational design. It's just how people are structured together, you know, and, and how they agree to work together and, and the mandate and the freedom that they have to, to change that and to continuously improve that. And for me, one of the most profound things that, that we have in, uh, in Agile is the retrospective meeting. So if, if teams are empowered to change things through their retrospective meetings, um, they can really you know, get, get real value from their practices and improve that. And along with the, the organizational people and, and, and their work comes back to one of the questions that we have here. So, so how to incentivize the team? What what have you seen works in terms of incentivization applied to teams in this space? Yeah, so that's a hard one, right? Um, <clears throat> but in terms of uh, of money, um, I'm of the opinion that people need to be paid enough so that money is not a problem, right? So if if you look at motivation, you get motivational motivating factors uh, and then you get hygiene factors so hygiene factors are the things that if it's not in place it makes me unhappy motivating factors are things that m actually motivate me now money contrary to popular belief is an high is a hygiene factor so if i don't have enough if i see that other people in the market are, are getting more than i'm getting you know then it becomes like an issue for me but if I have enough, adding more doesn't necessarily motivate me. And there's actually research showing that I can even be demotivated if I'm paid more than I think I'm worth. So um, I would say get money off the table uh, as much as possible. And then 
having small feedback loops is incentive in itself. Like seeing that what I did is actually making a difference to some user out there a week later. I mean, that's amazing. And very few soft, very few people in software get to see that. I mean, even in my career, I've worked on many projects that I, I never met a user. I never saw uh, analytics even from, from usage. And now being privileged enough to have my own app that you mentioned, uh, Firefinch, which is a birding app. It is so satisfying to see the app in people's hands and see that it actually makes a difference. Um, yeah, so that, that, in my opinion, so clear feedback loops is a massive incentive in itself. And then creating an environment, because we, like, intrinsic motivation is motivation that comes from inside and that really keeps me going. So intrinsic motivation there's, uh, consists of autonomy, mastery and purpose. Okay. So we can create an environment that is conducive to these things. We can't force it on people. So for, for uh, autonomy, we can create the playground for people and teams where they have decision-making power. So we put down boundaries and we say, you can play within these boundaries. And these are the principles and the metrics and the things. Then for mastery, like allow people to grow, give them opportunities to grow. In, um, you can't make them grow, but you can create an environment where they can. And purpose, have, and that, that purpose, that's where the feedback loop comes back in. Um, if they can see that they are actually making a difference, if the vision is casted over and over, that, uh, that really helps. So Thank I you, hope Steve. that helps. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I think we we take it for granted sometimes to kind of go, okay, so DevOps or DevSecOps is already in play, but for some of those in our audience, they may well be in an organization where they might have adopted Agile, they are using Scrum, but they haven't formally paid attention to methodology that is for the purposes of DevOps. So in organizations that are, are new to this or where someone is looking to pioneer the introduction of this, where do they start? What, what do they take into the organization first to lay a foundation for DevOps? It's like, I think the, 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 the starting point is, do we want to improve? Do we want to get value to the customer faster? Uh, because that with that with that vision of getting value to the customer faster, we can start looking at these metrics, the lead time for changes. Because we can, it, it doesn't help that we build all this software, but it it's getting stuck somewhere in our testing processes, or there's some release manager that that's uh, their head is full of all these changes um, and it's really painful to deploy so we do, we do, we don't deploy frequently um, and then coming to the point where we agree that this is something that we want to do because if it's not something we want to do then you're going to waste your energy right um, but start if we can agree that this is something we want to do then we can say okay let's use these metrics and let's look at practices that exist, that uh, have existed since even the early 2000s. And let's look at some of these practices and look at what can we, are there low hanging fruits? And can we do it in a, in, in a pocket? So, so normally if it's a big organization, it's a good idea that, you know, we try things small and if they work, we roll out big. Um, so have, have that pockets of, of innovation and incentivize like, or, or just giving the mandate and giving the time for people to do that again. So you have to get buy-in from all levels. You have to get buy-in from leadership as well as the grassroots and, and talk to the pain. Like when, when there's, when there's a painful deployment, ask, maybe this is so painful because it's the first deployment we've done in six months. 
maybe if we do it more often, it won't be this painful. Fantastic. And to some of the, your commentary early on and your, even your question to the audience, what, what is DevOps? And quite often folks will go, well, it must be a set of tools for deployment, et cetera. But just hitting in that space, because you have covered that it's far more than just the tool set, but for perhaps an organization that is embarking on this, is there a particular tool set or ecosystem that supports DevOps more effectively that you'd go, if you haven't got anything, this is a great place to start? Well, there are, there's, there's such a myriad of, of tools um, at the moment. What I would say is that look at, look at tools that integrate well. Um, uh, and these days, a lot of tools do integrate well, but if if you're a Microsoft shop like Azure DevOps, it's, it's something easy to to go with, um, and then and Jenkins is is well known. Um, if you manage it yourself, there might be issues with with updates um, that you regularly have to do. Uh, so there are things that have been automated for us. So if you're a small team. I would say like, rather not try to do everything yourself. Start with something that that uh, is ma managed for you. And then as you get issues with with that, then rather go go more niche. Don't go too niche in the beginning and then um, find yourself maintaining all of this and then spending so much time on all your aut automation that you're not getting to the work, right? Like that's missing the point completely. Yeah, um, so I wouldn't say like there's, there's, there's one answer for that. It's very like context specific, you know. Okay, fantastic. In quite often in terms of when we're consulting to organizations around agile transformation and adopting methodologies like Scrum, it's, it's very necessary to set a foundation in terms of common terminology, understanding of intent, the objectives and and what it is that this thing is about. Do you find that that's true of DevOps too, to establish basically common language and common understanding yeah. of what it is? Yeah, excellent point. And 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 that's why I we created this training um, because it it is high level enough that anyone can join and understand. Very much like this like this talk, um, but it creates that language to bring people together um, so that we can say, okay, together we want to achieve this. And like somebody, somebody said, DevOps is a top, top down um, approach. It's not necessarily a top down approach uh, because the leadership won't know the pain that we're feeling sometimes uh, underneath, but leadership, like uh, there's, there's this idea of the law of the lid. We can only go to where the lid is, right? So leadership, they, they, they need to understand at least what we're trying to do. And that's also why I said if, uh, with your question, if someone wants to introduce this, you have to buy the mandate from leadership. And this is a great course for that um, to, to help people get the same language. Every organization where I, where I work as a consultant or a fractional CTO, I do this training. I get everybody to go through the training so that they, that shared language is there because before that shared language is there, we will try things and nobody will understand. And sooner or later, the rug will be pulled underneath you and you won't understand why. Um, but it's because we're talking different languages. So great point. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. I think in support of that, quite often from the consulting side of software development, Clients will go, I want a full stack developer. And, and their meaning when they say that is they actually want someone that can do everything from product management through requirements management, through development, testing, deployment, security, and nowadays add in AI on top of that as well. I, I would imagine the context of DevOps and giving people that roadmap to how to improve and how many different roles this actually requires. Is a bit of an eye opener for people to go, wow, it's more complex than I had thought. 
and the areas of specialization these days are That's deeper huge. than what any one person can do. Are, are you seeing that as a response from people that, that come into the space and start asking about DevOps? Yes, definitely. And, and, <clears throat> and a lot of times in, in the South African context, uh, especially like small, medium organizations, you also want DevOps, right? But it's not always necessary to get like a, full, like a team of full-time DevOps engineers. Because, and by the way, they're very expensive. Um, so it, it makes a lot of sense to use consultants to help you out and just, it, you know, they pay the school fees. Um, at least just when you make decisions about what, what tooling to use, what to tackle first, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and how to keep things simple because very quickly things can get really hairy. Um, if you just, if you, like, if you start with Googling Kubernetes, you're down at rabbit hole. <laughs> and if you don't have some guidance there, you might, you'll burn a lot of cash. <laughs> An interesting question that's come through that I'm going to pick up on is, yeah. is there such a thing as DevOps light? I would say, like, stick to first principles. And that's why, that's why I also decided to talk about the push-pull thing here. Um, It's about getting the code to the to the end user as quickly as possible. It's about deploying more frequently. So I'm doing DevOps Lite with my app, for example. I have a very simple script um, that deploys my my app with one with with one command. It deploys it to to the App Store and I've got for the Android as well. Um, and it's just about like automating the things that can make, that can bite you um, and just give, you know, the, the things that need to be repeated the same way over and over and over. Don't have people do that. Have machines do that. Um, so you don't have to Kubernetes anything um, from the start. Uh, maybe it depends on your solution. but. You can have very, very simple pipelines, but the idea is just that you want to get that value in front of the user, stick to that principle, and keep it as simple as possible to get there. Okay. So it, it occurs to me that the metaphor here is it's creating a pipe with a trickle that's running through it, as opposed to a system of canals where you're raising the level in one canal and then flooding another and then flooding another and then flooding another. So I, I guess that helps me kind of go, there's a fundamental difference there, Stefan. Yeah. I appreciate it. I like that method, metaphor, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, we, we are running a little bit short on time. Um, I am looking for any other questions that come through from our audience, but I, I would ask you perhaps if, there were three things that you said were were key enablers for success with DevOps. What what might those three things be? <clears throat> Organizational design. So having cross fun cross functional teams and, and giving people the mandate to collaborate. Because by default, people won't know that I can help my buddy um, because then I'm not doing my own work right giving people the mandate to work together and even for long periods like whatever it takes sit together do work together and cross-functionally not just developers but having a BA sit with a developer while the developer is typing and keeping the the, the ubiquitous language of the domain um, rich and, and accurate uh, so that's, and then pool systems. So creating pool systems, and and then third, I would say, really think about your incentives, um, and and the unintended consequences that your incentives can create, if you, 
if it, because people like we're just people, right? If you give me a system, I will game the system. If, if you say, if you tell me you incentivize this, I will optimize for that. So you have to, yeah, you have to think about what you want to optimize for. And that's why these metrics are so great. It is team wide, organizational wide. Let's optimize together for this. It's not you as an individual. Um, you're not going to get your increase at the end of this year because you helped the buddy instead of you know, churning out code or something. <laughs>